For our final conversation about inclusive growth's place in a new social contract, we are honored to welcome to the stage former Secretary of State and Chair of the Stonebridge Albright Group, Madeline Albright. And here with her is Joshua Johnson, founding host of WAMU and NPR's 1A. Don't placate me. <laughs> They're here to hear you. They, <laughs> they don't even need, they, you could just talk for the next 26 minutes and 54 Yo, seconds. No, I need you. And they'd yeah. be just fine. Yeah. Well, Secretary Albright, hi. Hello. How are you? Great. Good, Good. to see you. Good. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It, it, as if there is nothing around the world for us to discuss. Yeah, the world's a mess. That's a diplomatic term of art. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> about hearing you say the world's a mess. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that what we have seen is various rules that have been operational primarily since the end of the Second World War have really totally been uh, disaggregated in a way, and people don't know what to do. And in fact, national governments are complicated and international structures are complicated. And then I have to say, I wasn't going to use this line right away because it's totally plagiarized, but it describes what's gone on, which is that people are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. The governments are listening to them on 20th century technology and providing 19th century responses. <laughs> so they are not dealing with the issues that are out there uh, that have created the divisions, and that's why we need to really look at a global way of being inclusive and dealing with the various issues that are out there in the 21st century. And even to carry it a step further here in this country, we're trying to do it through the lens of an 18th century foundational document and try to reinterpret it for today. So it feels like the challenges we face are almost interpretational, or we're trying to kind of figure out who we are to one another again? The document is fine. It's the current interpretation of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're as big a fan of it as I am. Yeah, I, I rather like it. <laughs> One of the concepts that we wanted to frame this around was this idea of the social contract. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote about it back in the 1760s. How do you see that applying to what the folks in this room do? Well, I think we have to figure out what in the simplest term it is about. It is a contract between the people and the government. And it is supposed to provide fairness and equality and each side has some responsibility to the other. And my sense is that as a result of a number of different um, elements that are out there, the social contract is broken. Some of what I said in my uh, plagiarized line, but also partially because there have been so many changes that have happened in society, technology um, that hasn't been totally absorbed in terms of who has what jobs and who has, in listening to the panels earlier, the skills that people need in order to operate in this. What is happening to the infrastructure that has been um, undermining some of the community aspects of things. And so many of the issues that people could figure out how to deal with earlier now all seem incredibly mysterious and that there isn't the infrastructure to deal with it and there isn't this sense about that there should be a contract that there is in democracies, um, which I favor, uh, is that there, it is important to have the government responding to what the people need and the people understanding what their responsibilities are towards that government. Where do you think that the break is the largest? I mean, the, depending on who you ask, and when I travel the country and talk to various people in various walks of life, it's clear to me anyway that on a one-on-one -on -one level, we're still community to community, city to city, we're pretty good at dealing with our neighbors one-on-one -on -one in the larger senses when it comes to state government and, and international government, national government. That seems to be where the breakdown is, but where do you see it? Is there, is there a source for the crack that we can point to? I, I think it is the fact that um, that contract doesn't work and therefore that people, the way they see what government owes them is viewed in a different way in different places. And part of what I think has happened is because 
people sense that they're not getting their due or aren't able to live the way they should, they need somebody to blame. And so they blame the other. And then when you have leaders that in fact exacerbate those differences by identifying with one group at the expense of another, you do get this very large division when what we're trying to do is get inclusiveness when in fact you're getting exclusiveness or even not dealing with anybody at all. But you're always looking for who's at fault when you have, a, when you have leaders who want to exacerbate the differences rather than trying to figure out how we get ourselves together because there will be differences just by the way, you know, the, the climate that people live in or the jobs they have. And what you want are leaders that understand that we are better off when the contract works um, and when we look for what we have in common rather than what um, differentiates us. I wonder how you see this problem today compared to how it's manifested in the past. You've written in your book about fascism uh, describing some of the way that uh, fascistic and authoritarian leaders in the past have kind of dealt with the people of their day. And you include a quote from Adolf Hitler describing the secret of his success. And he, re he said, quote, I will tell you what has carried me to the position I have reached. Our political problems appeared complicated. The German people could make nothing of them. I reduced them to the simplest terms. The masses realized this and followed me." Unquote. So is this an old problem? Is this a new version of an old problem? Or is this something brand new? Uh, well, I think that there's always been a problem in terms of how societies work together. And the, what has happened with the fascistic leaders is that instead of trying to help people understand the complexity of a problem, they do exactly kind of saying, I'm the stable genius, and I have all <laughs> the answers. And, and Mussolini is the one who said that first. And what was interesting was there were issues in Italy, for instance. Italy had not been, had fought on the side of the Allies during World War I, but they were not recognized properly. They had economic problems. They didn't have the answers. And Mussolini comes along and says, I know how to deal with this. I'm going to, and he literally did say, I will drain the swamp. Um, and Drenare la palude, he yeah, coined the term. No, he did. And so I think there was this business of there is an answer. It's a simple answer, and I can answer it and just follow me. The part that I found interesting in writing the book, in writing about Mussolini and Hitler, they both came to power constitutionally. There wasn't a revolution. In Italy, King Emmanuel gave Mussolini the power. In Germany, von Hindenburg gave it to Hitler. And the other countries that I write about now, were the leaders were all elected. And so one has to understand what creates this kind of a desire for a simple answer and it is that the problems are complicated, and I think we have to understand that, which is why I think some of the discussions that I heard earlier are so useful in terms of looking for ways of which elements of our society can help to solve the problems so that you don't have to fall for somebody that says, I've got all the answers. There are, I wonder how you, see it, how you see that rethinking playing out in some of the current challenges that we're seeing around the world. I mean, you know, we learned today that, you know, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said, I can't form a government, we're going to have to figure this out another way. Britain is trying to deal with Brexit, there may be an election coming up later this year, Boris Johnson's hands are increasingly tied by the House of Commons, there may be another effort to put forth just a Brexit party if there's another election. So it seems like through the existing systems, through the existing social contract, we're still hitting these log jams with these gigantic imperatives that need to be dealt with. What breaks the logjam? I think what could break the logjam are leaders that aren't looking for how to divide us, that are actually looking for some kind of common answers and, and have a discussion with the people and not treat them as if they are just kind of pawns in a game. Um, and part of the problem, each one of it you look at on Brexit, people didn't have a clue what they were voting for. Um, and by the way, uh, just to prove I'm no longer a diplomat, uh, 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 I was actually in Warsaw a couple of years ago, and I was describing what had happened in Brexit, and I said it came as a result of miscalculation and incompetence, and then I ran into David Cameron. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, and I think that there really are issues where there's been kind of a lack of understanding of the various megatrends that are going on, um, how technology affects us, how globalization affects us, um, how people feel 
Um, one of the parts I love to talk about, the mega trend of globalization, which has really been uh, the, the way that we've all operated, and we really have, most of us have gained by globalization. But the problem is that it does have a double-edged sword, and that is that, in fact, it's faceless. People talk about the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels or at the UN. And, and the, the truth is that we want what, to know what our identities are. We don't want to be just part of some faceless group, which is fine. I think we all want to know what our background is, linguistic, ethnic, um, you know, religious, um, and that's fine. But if my identity hates your identity, then it becomes nationalism, and hyper-nationalism is very dangerous. I was listening to the Central Europeans, kind of. There's a lot of hyper-nationalism going on in Central Europe. Um, as a product of it myself, as a Czechoslovak, um, I really I can see what's happening in terms of somebody like Viktor Orban making more out of, I don't want anybody but Hungarians living here. You said that you, when you first met Viktor Orban, he seemed like a very different person than what he turned into. Well, very interesting. I met him in the 80s because I'm uh, with the National Democratic Institute. I'm chairman of the board. And we went and we met him in the 80s. And he was just everybody's favorite dissident. We brought him to the United States, any number of different things. I think all of a sudden, and this is what happens, that leader that has the answers, the power go to his head. By the way, they're all his. Um, and um, so uh, I, I think that then they think that they, they, their answers are the suitable answers. And so I do think, by the way, the best quote in the book actually is from Mussolini, who says, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, Nobody notices. And there's a lot of feather plucking going on right now. And you can't say those two words together too quickly. No, you can't. <laughs> you, um... <laughs> I am no longer a diplomat. You're not a diplomat anymore. <laughs> you, you, really, you really aren't a diplomat no, anymore. No, definitely not. <laughs> I kind of like you that way. <laughs> that well, and I, and I think I understand where you're coming from, but on the flip side, I hear where you're coming from, but on the flip side, when I think about, you know, the people who supported Brexit, for example, or the people who are in President Trump's political base, I think they would contrastingly say, I voted for this in our national interest too. I believe that we're better off leaving the European Union. I believe that we're better off with a leader who recognizes Americans who feel like they are being left behind by globalization and immigration, et cetera. This is my view of the same concept. I just see it the other way around. What about that? Well, I think that the issue is that even just the way you describe it, it's all negative. It's somebody else's fault that things are like this, that it's the immigrants, for instance, that was the problem in, in the United Kingdom. All of a sudden, the Polish plumbers that were coming and various people and taking their jobs. And the European Union was really based on an openness and a freedom of movement in the, and travel and being able to have jobs in different places. So all of a sudden, it's their fault. The same thing happens um, in the United States, frankly, is that there are people all of a sudden whose fault it is. We don't want all those foreigners coming. Um, that are rapists and murderers, and it's all. And both of these concepts are based on the fear factor. There is somebody that you are afraid of, and the leader has identified himself with one group at the expense of the other, and they are the scapegoats. And then you blame them for everything, including you as a member of the fake news operation and an enemy of the people. And so part of the issue is how is it that people get their information if automatically if as a leader, I disagree with you, you're providing fake news. And so then what do you, what, how do you think and figure out what the truth is? And so it's undermining a whole bunch of things that we have needed for the functioning of democracy. A free press is basic to a democracy. Um, and if you decide that just because you don't like what somebody says about you, you're a fake, or that it's that person's fault who's just arrived from Guatemala, um, or name the country. By the way, I'm an immigrant, and, um, and I, uh, nothing made more difference in my life than to become an American. And I think that all of a sudden, uh, the way that we view immigrants, the Statue of Liberty is weeping. You have said in your... 
as you've told your story, you talk about going from Czechoslovakia to London and being welcomed by the British saying, we're so sorry about what happened to your country. You're welcome here. What can we do to help? And when are you going home? And then <laughs> later you came to the US and they said, we're so sorry about what happened to your country. You're welcome here. What are you doing? And when do you become a citizen? Right. And I find in that same vein that there are lots of different groups of people, again, as I travel all over the country, who are trying to deal with these problems in different ways as there, you know, there's a large Syrian population that's moved into Nashville. There's a large Somali American population that's moved into Minneapolis and done amazing things with their neighborhood to revitalize parts Absolutely. of town that were dead before they showed up. No question. Where do you see the social contract being rebuilt? Even if clumsily, because there's no easy answers, do you see any places where it's starting to kind of come together? Well, I do think some of the things you were saying in terms of um, immigrants that are making a difference somewhere, so I think that there are local communities where in fact there is a rebuilding of it. Um, I don't see an awful lot internationally, frankly, because we're still kind of at a, at a period where um, countries don't trust their neighbors or one of the real issues that's gone on and, and obviously I'm going to look at the international situation more is because of the problems in the Middle East creating all of a sudden a group of refugees that were coming into Europe that then that and, and Angela Merkel who said you're welcome here and the other rest of the countries thought that was a mistake. Then you've got the Brexit thing It's kind of like a virus that is spreading and the United States which used to be welcoming to people all of a sudden also has decided that immigrants are a problem and so it is hard to move against that but I do think that when people really get to know each other they can appreciate and one of the panelists here earlier said Diversity is our strength, not our weakness. And there are not a lot of people that actually were born here. You weren't, and I wasn't. You know, and so, or your family. Family was, but, right. But I think that, that basically there is that issue about diversity. By the way, I, I love telling this story, and some of you have heard it, but my favorite thing to do is to hand out naturalization certificates. And the first time I did it was July 4th, 2000 at Monticello. I figured since I had Thomas Jefferson's job, I could actually do that. Yeah. And so I gave this man his naturalization certificate, and he walks away, and he said, can you believe it? I'm a refugee, and I just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. And I went up to him, and I said, can you believe that the Secretary of State is a refugee? So that is something about America. I wonder how you see, based on this changing social contract, or maybe uh, eroded and evolving social contract, the way that we deal with other international crises. For instance, the, the invasion by Turkish forces into northern Syria and what's happening to Kurdish forces. The US troops have been leaving and Kurds were throwing rocks and rotten produce at them, kind of cussing them out as they, as they left town. I've heard a lot of people say that the story of the Kurds just doesn't even register, that Americans are more concerned with our military image and, frankly, what we're going to do in Syria, in Afghanistan, et cetera, and that makes it harder for us to kind of wrap our heads around conflicts like what's happening in northern Syria and the Kurds and the Turks and the Syrians and the Russians and, ah, too complicated, too much to deal with, but that's the world we live in. So how do we help people who aren't steeped in these issues? How do we help them find their way forward, understand them, engage with them? Well, I do think we have to remember um, what the role of the United States is. I, I have to say that I have seen the United States as a force for good of trying to figure out how to help countries where, in fact, there may be prejudice and ethnic cleansing and um, then uh, kind of natural disasters that also bring people into conflict in terms of um, who can get um, away from a flood or how climate change affects us. This is not easy. And I think that the part that has to happen is to make it very real for people in order to understand that, these, that we're all human beings and that certain things happen in certain places and that we don't want to see people killing each other for who they are, not for anything that they did. And so I think that's part of it. I have to admit, however, that the Middle East situation is unbelievably complicated, and even I, every morning, have to get up and figure out who's on whose side. 
um, and the various group, uh, groups. But the tragedy is that Turkey, which has been a strong country, um, doesn't seize Turkish citizenship in a way that they don't accept the Kurds. And then that, in fact, then translates into saying that they're all terrorists um, and that they are really hurting Turkey. But a lot of the issue has to do in Turkey with the immigration, because all of a sudden they have a lot of immigrants from other parts of the Middle East. I can explain it all, but it'll take a long time. Right. Uh, it'll but, about eight but, minutes. But, but I do think that one of the issues here is that the United States is not looking at our role as one in which we can help global inclusiveness. And we are, in fact, just looking at what we're interested in. Uh, we see ourselves as victims all of a sudden instead of the most powerful country in the world. And we are not helping to solve the problems. And so what I would love to get at, because I've, I'm very, I'm on the board at Aspen, and we're talking about how, in fact, to see what the problems have been with the social contract. Can we do something to fix it? And I think our partnership with MasterCard is incredibly important and very grateful for what they're doing um, with uh, Aspen because we're on the same wavelength in terms of trying to figure out, and, and a lot we talked about was domestic inclusiveness, but that global inclusiveness also affects our domestic situation. But it's so, I get the sense that people are so confused, they're overwhelmed, they're tired. It's just easier to have someone who says, just let me handle it, put all your eggs in my basket and I will deal with them and I will get back at the people who put you in this lot in life. It seems like there's this increasing coalescence around the Recep Tayyip Erdogan's and the Rodrigo Duterte's and the Jair Bolsonaro's, the very strong man leaders, for lack of a better term, because as you mentioned, globalization, technology has almost made us feel so close that we almost feel naked with one another. And it's just easier to have one person push everyone away and just give me my breathing space back. Well, I do think that, uh, first of all, democracy is complicated. Um, and it doesn't offer immediate answers. And one of the things that there are problems in society, there's no question, and we can go back to some of them do have to do with technology. Some of them do have to do with the fact that people are not educated, don't have the right skills to deal with the new technology. And I can lay out all the problems, but what has to happen, and I think most of us have gone through arguments of what comes first, political um, change or um, economic change. They have to go together. Democracy has to, uh, uh, deliver because people want to vote and eat. And so the bottom line is how to figure out what kind of a government will give you that. But, and uh, the best example of what doesn't work is, for instance, we were all talking about the Arab Spring at a certain point. What happened was people in Egypt were summoned by social media to Tahrir Square, uh, and they all had their own kind of way of that they had heard about it. They get there and they don't have a clue what to do. Um, and then, I'm the last one to say this, but elections in Egypt came too soon. The Muslim Brotherhood was organized, and the people um, in Tahrir Square didn't know what they were doing. And so Cairo was a mess all the time. And then what happens, and I made this up, an older guy in the um, suburbs wants to come in to open uh, his uh, stall in the marketplace. Cairo's a mess, and he says, to hell with this. Uh, I want order, and now they have a military government. And that's how you and, go from and the bar to the And this is from more... one to the other. Right. That's well, the problem. And, and that's what's happened in a variety of places. Either there really are problems, or people make them up. Viktor Orban made up that the problem was that the, uh, Hungary didn't want anybody but Hungarians. And then they said, I, I did actually a survey in the 90s, and one of the questions that we did was asked, do you think a piece of your country is in a neighboring country? And I will never forget, 80% Hungarians thought a piece of their country was in the neighboring country. And so you get a leader who says, I got to get it back. Uh, or there's some excuse for everybody. And Erdogan, I think, really, who started out having been democratically elected, all of a sudden begins to see an enemy so that he can have more and more control. Let me ask you about <clears throat> solutions in the time that we have left. Oh, my mother texted me a question for you. <laughs> I'll get to that later. Uh, I love her, and it's a good question, but I'll get to that later. 
In terms of solutions, you know, I, one of the things that I know people want right now is leadership that delivers. Yes, it's nice that we have to figure out how we're going to live with one another and how we're going to, you know, restructure the global social order, but like you said, we got to vote and we got to eat. Give me an example of something concrete that either the people listening to this, the folks in this room, everyday citizens can do to fix this social contract that will show a result, that I can look at it and go, there's the result of what we did. Well, I think I, you know, I have, we have the see something, say something. I've added to that, do something. Um, and I think on the things that one has to do, frankly, is to call out what's gone wrong. Uh, and, I, and I think we're not doing that in terms of having uh, people that are, think they're above the law or that the uh, press is the enemy of the people. But I think one of the things, and this is a hard part, uh, you have to talk to the people that you disagree with not tolerate them, because that's just kind of put up with it, but try to figure out what is motivating them, and then try to figure out solutions together. And then, I have to tell you, what we have to do um, is count an awful lot on the young people that have different ideas. Um, the Parkland kids, or Greta, who has told the people at the UN that they were all jerks, because they didn't. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that there are things that need to be solved, and I, Part of the social contract is taxes. They have to be fair. You can't have one group of people that control things and the other people who don't understand that living in a civilized society, the price of it is paying taxes. Now, let me stop you right there because I have, I have seen videos from other, for the World Economic Forum and so on, where that very thing, taxation, comes up and the whole room sounds just like that. And no one wants to talk about it, because once you get to a certain level, when push comes to shove between haves and have-nots, that seems to be one of those places where the people at the tippy-tippy top just don't want to hear it. Well, as I've listened to the commitments that have been made here, these are people that work in companies that are at the tippy-tippy top, and they do want to do something. That's what uh, my sense is. And I think that combination of public-private partnerships, and just because there are some truly selfish people, doesn't mean that people that do have some access to uh, finances and various organizations don't want to help. I think most people would like to operate in a way where you're able to solve the problems by being, uh, what I find interesting, by the way, as I was listening to the Central Europeans, uh, they lived under communism, um, which theoretically was more equal. Then what happened is they went to privatization too fast and created this elite group, and then all of a sudden all the working class people didn't have anything. And so we're trying to figure out, many of us, what went wrong in Central and Eastern Europe. And some of it is because there has to be some form of equality. There has to be some way where there isn't a group of people living off the work of others. And I think it's not socialism, but it is a social contract where there is some way of paying for what the services of the government are so that the people can live a decent life and not at the expense of some people being really rich and other people living in neighborhoods um, that we heard about where people don't have anything. And that's what's broken. And I do think that a, con um, a conference like this where people are looking at what good they can do is the most valuable. I really, I learned a lot in terms of the inclusiveness. It can't be exclusiveness. It needs to be inclusiveness. Two more quick questions. How much stock do you put in next year's election to help solve some of what's wrong? And I mean that on both sides in terms of either the re-election of President Trump or any of the Democratic candidates and their ability to kind of push on some of the social problems you see. How much of it is in 2020 and how much of it is beyond 2020? I think it's in 2020 because we can't deal with more of this. So, uh, um, but I think the following thing, elections don't happen by accident. They require people to be interested in what the issues are and they require people to go and vote. 
uh, that is one of the major aspects. And so obviously on my to-do list is, what is it that we do to inform ourselves about the issues? And I hate to say this, but I think the debates where you're asked to raise your hand, whether you think there should be um, a health program is a little simplistic. Um, and so I think what we need to do is to make an effort to understand the issues better, to not be afraid to talk to people with whom we disagree to find out why they might not want to do it that particular way. But I do think we need to, democracies don't work if people don't vote. Um, and so I think there are crucial elections and it does in fact require the media to um, give us the facts as best, and then if the facts are not there from one source, you have to read a lot of others or listen to a lot of different sources. So we got to, it sounds like... We have a lot to do. There's a lot more yeah. homework we got to do. And definitely. The subjects are complicated, and you can't just have them happen, nor can you just... Um, and I wouldn't trust any one leader that says, I've got all the answers, because democracy is based on that interaction between the people and the leadership, and trying to find um, things that we do together. So by the way, when I said, was talking about Egypt before, we were there with the National Democratic Institute telling them that some of the people at an earlier stage needed to compromise and build coalitions. So then one of them said to me, you mean the way like you guys do it these days? So we are not exactly a great example of how to solve problems. Now I can hear some folks who will hear this and hear you say we've got a study more sources, it's more complicated, we gotta dig in more. I can hear some folks saying, it used to be so simple. We had one morning paper and one evening paper, there were three networks, and you either listened to John Chancellor or Walter Cronkite or Peter Jennings, and that's the way it was, or McNeil and Lehrer. <laughs> like, life was just simpler, and now you're telling us, we gotta do all the work Walter Cronkite used to do for us. Well, you do. We all do, I think. And as somebody, I teach, by the way, and I think that I tell my students they have to look at a number of different sources and, um, one of the, and try to figure it out. It makes you sound kind of a relativist about truth, but the bottom line is it, takes, it is harder work. There's no question about it. And you have to know what your sources are. You mentioned you're a teacher. So is my mom. She's a retired teacher. And so I think we should end with her question. Uh, <laughs> I texted her a picture. I texted her a picture of the back of your head. I'm really sorry. As we were going on stage, <laughs> you know, about to interview Madeleine Albright on stage. Any questions for her? Smiley face, thinking that it was a rhetorical question. But I know my mother, and she asked. She suggested that you should write a children's book. How would you explain what's happening in the world right now and what can be done to a child? Well, first of all, I think it's incredibly hard to write a children's book uh, because um, of the limited amount of vocabulary and things that one uses. But I would basically go back to the chicken um, uh, and try to explain that we have to understand what are the issues that are out there and watch very carefully and pay attention. Children are a lot smarter than we think they are, and they can see a phony they can understand that you have to, uh, especially if the parents really tell them, they have to cooperate, listen, um, and work with each other. Um, and I, but I do think that the way I would try to write a children's book is to explain that there is nothing more important than a society in which there are very different kind of people that add the elements of what they know in order to help each other and accept the fact that the differences among us is what makes us uh, great, and that we needed to understand what societies are about. But I would have a hard time writing a children's book. And for, for a child who's going through now some of what you went through when you were a kid, for a child who's an immigrant, who's a refugee, who's trying to kind of make sense of their place in the world, knowing in some, to some extent yeah. what they're going through, what would you say to them? Well. It's interesting because one of my issues, I moved around so much as a child that all I wanted to do was to fit into whatever society I was in. And so, in case you haven't noticed, I'm an extrovert. Um, and so what I've done is to try to make friends as much as possible and try to fit in in a way where I could maintain my individuality, but also try to figure out what I could do to help. 
And, and I, had, I did do that, I have done that, but I think a child, um, and especially one that is different from others, wants to be accepted and wants to have friends, and that means that you try to cooperate and try to figure out how you can be helpful in any community. I really do think that's what children do. Um, it was in, in my case, I tried very hard to fit in. It was not easy with my uh, parents. My mother read palms at dinner parties and uh, <laughs> served crazy food. And my father wanted to fit in in Colorado, which meant fishing. And he fished in a coat and tie. And there were just things <laughs> that I couldn't explain about them. But I, I do think that it is important to try to figure out how you fit in, how you uh, can really be a part of a group and understand what the other people want. That's what it's all about, is trying to share. So the world's a bit of a mess. We appreciate you helping us think through how we might be able to clean it up. Madam Secretary, thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thank Madeline you. Albright, everybody. Thank thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh